Hey, welcome back to Invisible Machines, a podcast produced in partnership with UX Magazine and OneReach AI. You know, Rob and I have had a lot of great opportunities to talk about home automation and how conversational AI really moves home automation into a whole new realm. Uh, we've also talked a lot about industrial design and uh, experience design in industrial settings specifically, but those are both areas that we've really wanted to dig deeper on. And today, we're fortunate to have one guest who, who has experience in both areas. We have this great conversation for you with David Bingham. Uh, David has held executive design positions with GE and Workday, and he's currently the director of experience design at Schneider Electric. Schneider Electric is a French multinational corporation that Fortune magazine has named one of the most desirable companies in the world four years running. And in 2021, they were deemed uh, the most sustainable company in the world. So they are doing some pretty exciting things at Schneider Electric. And David is right there uh, on the front lines working on some pretty exciting projects. We're really happy to be able to get into some of that with him today. And then we also, the, the discussion branches out. We talk about really how to design experiences that meet the moment that we're in with technology. We talk a bit about the uncanny valley and what that uh, looks like or I guess what that sounds like when it comes to conversational design. Uh, we have an interesting conversation about, about CRUD. Uh, software designers and data managers are no doubt familiar with, with this acronym, uh, create, read, update, and delete, the four basic operations of data management. Uh, we talk about adding seek to the mix and how having uh, systems that are designed to seek out information really elevates our relationship with data to a whole new level. Uh, and those are just some of the exciting things that we talk about with David. So we'll go ahead and get into that conversation right now. Really quickly, I would like to say thank you to everyone who's been listening to this podcast and watching this podcast, and especially those of you who have, uh, who have provided feedback on what you're hearing and seeing. Uh, that feedback is invaluable to us. Each week, we're working on making this a better program, and we really rely on hearing from our listeners to do that. So thanks again. And now I'm really excited to share this conversation with David Bingham. All right. Well, uh, David, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. We're certainly excited to have you here. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Yeah. And Rob, utterly yeah. delightful as always to see you. Yep, you got to yep. say something in your voice so we, it helps us differentiate right. voices for our audio listeners. There it is. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So... So David, you, you've had so many uh, experiences in design that Rob and I are really eager to talk about, but, but one of them that stuck out was uh, home automation because hey. we were actually asked recently to comment on, on Alexa kind of bringing generative AI into the fold. And we thought maybe we'd kick it off, just getting your thoughts on that. I mean, obviously there are kind of like privacy and uh, concerns with, with having effectively chat GBT that you can talk to in your house, hey. but it also does kind of open the door perhaps to a new sort of era in, in our relationship with technology. Uh, what, what do you think about that? Um, I, I think it's going to take some time to bubble into the way people relate to the technology in their home. Um, homes are very like safe spaces. Uh, I, I'm talking to my wife. I'm talking to my kid. Um, it's probably the most sort of private and sort of trusted area in a person's day, person's life. Um, so if you're going to invite an AI or a speaker there to listen to you or to be available to provide services to you, um, that that trust piece is huge, especially in this context. Yeah. I think it depends on what degree they implement it. Like if it's just yeah, like fuzzy match on wake words for skills, you know, that could be, that could be pretty useful, um, because you know you, the the idea of memorizing the wake words for all your skills to me is just an absolute non-starter. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if it's like simple point solution introductions, I could see it. You know, uh, we won't really notice it. We'll just notice that it's kind of better at recognizing <laughs> things, and and then. And then maybe if they used it for 
you know, failing more gracefully, you know, where it's not just like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Um, but it's, you know, I understand the kind of in, embedding the, the intent into the, you know, the, the sort of answer where it's like, Hey, those sounds like you're looking for pizza. That's not something I'm able to do, but if you want me to let you know when I can, I will something like that. You know, I could see it being useful, but if it's, if it's just like, Hey, talk to me and I'll just generate from my corpus. Uh, yeah, that could get scary. Well, I, I, I think it's a, there's some human training as well. I mean, there's a coming together, which is a movement on both sides, the, the, the human side, as well as the technology side. Um, I mean, probably one of the most regularly used voice features that we use uh, Siri in my house for is recording grocery list items. Um, and what used to be a pad of paper on the fridge or then became a shared reminder list between my wife and I on our phones um, is now shouted out into the air. <laughs> and and it's, it's, you know, something that... The technology didn't change as ton as much as we changed how we use the technology. We're still recording what we want to go to the grocery store and get. It's actually a reminder list just now populated yeah. via speech. Yeah, and it can say things like, oh, hey, add bananas and you can make banana bread with that list. Yeah. Like, oh. The, the, one, the one kicker we always get is we ask to add a uh, hot salsa and then you hear the response. I've added those two things. <laughs> Hot and salsa. <laughs> good. Yeah. Good, good, good job. Good. <laughs> I, now I wonder what, what do you receive when, what, what shows up? Yeah, what comes well, that's hot? Well, no, it, it, it puts out a list. We still, it's still not necessarily delivered. It's still a go to the store and now I can see all of the things. Oh, it's, got uh, it. It's on got the it. capture <laughs> side, not on the execution and delivery got side. Got it. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, it feels like people are, are sort of um, queasily maybe accustomed to technology in the house kind of listening. I mean, I know we still remark sometimes in our house, like if if you see an ad somewhere like in a, embedded in a web page and it's something that you were just talking about, you know, hours earlier, mm. that's, that's sort of a, a creepy feeling, but... I suppose it becomes less creepy if it's something that you actually really want and you're sort of thankful that that reminder is there. But it feels like for a while we'll be towing that line of like, how how good should I be at listening to you? And like, if, if I'm getting too much context and I seem to know too much, like how, how much is that going to alienate the user? It, it does well, feel like there's like kind of a very careful on-ramp that we need to build. Or, or, or yeah. if you become aware of it, can you leverage it? Like if I want a shirt for my birthday... And this has happened before. I've been looking at stuff and things start sliding into my wife's Instagram feed of things that I've looked at or I've been browsing around for because on the back end, it, <laughs> yeah. those were related. You know, I might yeah. be able to drop some subtle hints there, kind of kind of yeah. reverse leverage the sneakiness happening. Yeah. <laughs> and you could use it to your amongst advantage. Amongst the listeners. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think one well, of the then things if you start I'm having to... secrets too with your like, if oh. you, hey Alexa, like I I want this shirt. Can you kind of make sure that my just wife gets the it, message though. somehow? Oh, Don't tell her it's from me. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Yeah, I, I I'm excited. We do a lot of work with um, uh, customizing or creating skills uh, through conversation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and generative is critical to that. And so, um, that'll be interesting. S someday they'll get to that where, uh, the authoring of skills isn't relegated to developers, but now you can actually like do both the authoring, um, and, and experiencing of the skills like right there on the device. Anyone that can talk potentially could, could start to create skills. And I think that's, that's where it gets, in my opinion, that's where the rubber really hits the road where it democratizes the building of skills. Yeah. Um, and now we can kind of create these things. Anyone can. So, um, so we're like, Hey, I, you know, I want to create a skill that, you know, acts as a reminder to my kids to do their homework and then follows up, um, you know, something like that. 
Rob, do you do, you do that? Do you, or do you see the future of that being explicit or implicit in terms of training? For example, if I keep asking for hot salsa, uh, you know, I, I know I don't want hot and salsa. I need to kind of maybe explicitly program that in or set that up in a way versus a system recognizing that I, I tend to ask for this. And I don't know exactly what you mean by that. Can you kind of help nudge or it sees a, a human pattern in what's going on and identifies that as a system training need or a system training opportunity. Yeah. Cause it's, it's gleaning the behavior. Yeah. That sort of contextual memory component, um, super interesting and it's one of those things where I think we tend to imagine it in, in more of a, you know, symbolic AI sort of way, a, a, a deterministic way. Like it remembers these things and notices da, 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 and then does blah, blah, blah. Or that it just simply, you know, has that in its conversational memory. And as a result, it probabilistically like shapes things in a certain, in a certain way. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. and so like, in other words, does it create logic, um, from observing or does it simply just by the sheer nature of remembering past conversations, um, end up naturally, uh, if, you know, solving these issues. Um, and I think, you know, both are on the table and that's, that's a big part of the work we do is finding the balance between like sort of that symbolic AI or that deterministic level of software and then the algorithmic or probabilistic side of things or neural nets really like I kind of see it as neural nets versus de you know algorithms for determining yep and I I think AGI lives in a skills by skill balance you know of those two things some skills leaning way more towards, you know, deterministic stuff, kind of the, the things that are critical. Yeah. Um, and then the other side being more, you know, probabilistic, like write me a poem versus book me a doctor's appointment, right? Book me a doctor's appointment should lean way more towards that deterministic, you know, create a pattern, create a rule and use generative to kind of fill in the template gaps of like dates and things, but keep the structure of of it. So, so basically use generative AI to fill in an algorithmic template of of booking that because I have rules that, that need to be followed. Eh. Um, whereas write me a poem, I'm like, you know, very few rules other than, you know, Please use dirty language. <laughs> Flip that one around for you guys, just to a limerick, uh, yes, just yes. to keep you keep you on your toes. <laughs> Rob has some poetry well, There's like a blend, like you're, you're <laughs> describing a blend of of deterministic and probabilistic technology, kind of interacting, and and we we actually kind of went down a rabbit hole on this the other day for quite a while. Yeah, and it was funny because the that. more the further the further we went on deterministic, it was like it started edging into the world of probabilistic yeah. and then vice versa. So it it does, yeah, it doesn't feel like, it feels more like a duality than a than a high contrast separation or something like that. Yeah. yeah, and I think a lot of people look at it in a general sense, like the system itself, you know, leaning somewhere in the middle. But I think you have to look at it skill by skill. I think you got to break down the skills and say some skills would lean more towards deterministic others would lean more towards probabilistic um what well, and and what about what about domains you know josh you yeah kind of stop talking about home automation and yeah i did a lot of work with that in my earlier career um so through uh my path it's much more industrial side now much more think infrastructure energy manufacturing uh where there's you talk about you talk about rules 
there's a lot of rules mm, yeah <laughs> and a lot of criticality yeah, you almost think of like a company as just a bunch of rules um yeah that people follow at scale and that successful companies are where simple those rules are simple enough for most people to understand so they they can follow them <laughs> and 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 uh, relevant long enough that um that you can make money over time you know and it's like oh I, I found a great set of algorithms that seems to be simple enough for humans to execute reasonably well and s- seems to stay relevant over a period we were talking about this in a prior podcast like the McDonald's hamburger. It's the way you cook it, the ingredients you put in. Those are just algorithms that seem to be generally appealing, simple enough for any high school kid to follow and relevant for decades. Uh, and then you go, yeah. yeah, is is AI's job to follow the rules impeccably? Like as in, you know, when, when we look, we're working on the Dreamliner, the idea like, no, no, I just need AI to f- kind of like chess i need ai to follow the rules exactly mm-hmm. flawlessly every time humans are not as good at, at machines so so i i want the ai to 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 be flawlessly following rules that's that's what i want versus i want it to make up the rules and 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 come up with better rules mm-hmm. um and you're like okay well sometimes they do most times they don't <laughs> Um, but what I love about AI is it can follow complex algorithms. So maybe we don't have to dumb these things down. Um, and, and maybe that's like, oh, now they can stay relevant longer because they're adaptive while staying within those boundaries and and complex. And maybe that changes the the game of businesses have to be simple algorithms that last a long time to now they can be complex adaptive algorithms. Um I mean, in my in my space, kind of flashing back to my point about humans having a safe space in the home and adapting them to the technology. A, 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 as AI progresses in ways that I think were very very unexpected, you know, it started moving into the arts and moving into like write write me a poem. When we think of it, much more about the math and what computers are good at. I think, in, <laughs> but but now it's doing all of these unexpected things. What's what's the human role? in this like if you think of decision making and you split a decision into saying is there part of this that an ai can support and is there part of this that a human could and should support as the ai starts to do more and more of kind of both of those things and unexpectedly human things yeah what needs to be the human role in this i know and 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 i agree is that like on this vector of like compliance in other words sometimes i just wanted to be compliant you know um i think of this with my kids sometimes i just want them to put their shoes on and (laughs) comply (laughs) comply please (laughs) and i don't want them coming up with creative ways to do it you know just you know i like oh what dad watch i'll put my shoes on while standing on one leg on this stool like no just sit down and get your shoes on please we're in a hurry um and then sometimes I want to play with them and I want and I want them to have that freedom. And, hey. and it, so if so with my AI, like how much do I want it to just be compliant and how and when do I want it to kind of, you know, be more creative and inventive? Again, comes down to a skill by skill basis. Like, I don't know what's the context, you know, <laughs> um, Either a compliance slider. Be, be more yeah. creative. <laughs> yeah. Just follow the rules. Yes, <laughs> yes. exactly. Uh-huh. <laughs> and like, who makes the rules? Uh, no, I don't want you making the rules. Like, oh no, you can you can make the rules a little bit. Yeah, the yeah. compliance slider. I like it. I, it just should be, you know, just on my watch. You know, like, mm, you know, yeah. just. What? When do I uh, want you to be more should compliant? Be a, human should be a big, big node or big part of that uh, ecosystem, right? Where at least initially as these systems systems are coming into shape like humans should be we call it human in the loop but i mean they should be oh, yeah. part of an active part of most decisions that are being made right and then that would slowly start to shift um but yeah, yeah. it is an interesting question like where where do 
Yeah, and where it gets where interesting is where compliance end. like gets third party. So you're like, like you want the thing to not to be compliant, mm. but then somebody programmed the thing, like your boss programmed it to make you compliant to it, <laughs> right? And you're like, wait, no, I want I want the AI to be compliant to me, and your boss is like, no, I told the AI to make you be compliant to it, and mm. it's just in the middle going. I don't know who who wins this right now. The AI doesn't care, right? It's like I'll do I'll be whatever you want me to be, but you guys need to figure this out. <laughs> uh, I mean, Josh to the human in the loop piece, that's a that's a big part of of my world. I mean, we we look at massive amounts of machine data and um electrical system data like time series out the wazoo. Um, how are we finding patterns? How are we finding insights into all of this? But still presenting that to people to ultimately make a decision based on what's being surfaced or letting them query that and return things that might be, you know, outside the purview. It doesn't doesn't fit in the human brain, but it will yeah. fit into an AI system. But when it comes to pulling in things that can't get into the computing system back to like, what's the, what's the human role in all of this? How can we set up humans to be very human super sensors that augment these AI systems love and combine it. together to make that? Decision? Yeah. I love the idea of humans yeah. as an IOT node, you know, as a sensor in the IOT community. Um, yeah. And and then saying, hey, because we're here, we're all going to talk linguistically, okay, to each other. Like, no more JSON, you two. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, I, I like, we, it's that feeling like if you've ever been in a table where, where you don't speak the language, but everyone else does. Like, yeah. no, no, no. I don't, <laughs> you guys got to talk so I can understand you, please. I mean, I, I, I currently work at a very large French company, so I, I get that regularly. <laughs> <laughs> ah, we. <oui>. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I bet you do. Um, yeah, but yeah. The decision-making so piece is really interesting, too, because um, because that's where AI has a lot of strength, right? It can, it can help people make really well-informed decisions, and we kind of see people drawn to that power through, like, uh, freely available LLMs. Like, I think one of the more <laughs> popular things to have it do is summarize the long article that you don't have time to read the whole thing right so it can help you make a better decision help you make help make you look more intelligent but then yeah, there's right. also that piece of of like is this summary actually accurate like yeah. how reliable is this information yeah. and when it comes from a chat interface and it's in human language we seems like we're inclined to kind of think that it knows what it's talking about yeah, so. yeah. i'm super big on this this design pattern that you know what i sort of think of as like core bot stuff um it's like the primary design pattern which is uh it it, it kind of comes back to what you were talking about like i have a bunch of logs it's watching so i can talk to my logs me mm. um yeah and but then you're like and at first to most people that's like oh that's cool i want to talk to my logs or 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 load the whole book in and i want i want to talk to my book or my document or my spreadsheet, right? And we're like, ah, that's so cool. And then you give it to people and they sit there with a blank, like, I don't know what to ask it. I don't, even, I don't know what it, what's in it to even, like, how are my logs doing? Oh, they're great today. Um, yeah, yeah. So, but if you combine this other paradigm, which is like the newsfeed paradigm, and you use it to, to like say, hey, give me a feed of interesting information from my logs. And then it generates like a news feed of, of things that might be relevant and interesting about your logs. And now you start scrolling that news feed. So we see feeds that are generated or posts that are generated by AI from these things. And then that spurs questions. Yes. And so you're like, oh, that's interesting. And then you can now dig in. And I love this combination of proactive communication from generative and then the Q&A side. And I think those pair up extremely well as a design, uh, as a design pattern that kind of goes, oh, okay, 
now we get into algorithms again. So now we get into like symbolic AI, like algorithms to extract relevancy, right? Um, that might be just templates that get run to find newsworthy things that then creates posts that then prompts questions um, that are more generative and less symbolic. Um, so I, it's a good combination, like just like the book. Loaded the book in. Now, let's say every day I generate a post for you in the feed from the first like three pages, then the next three pages, then the next three pages. And, and so without reading the book and on a daily basis intertwined in maybe other in your feed is posts from the book, but then you're over here going, Oh, that's an interesting one. Tell me more about that. We, um, love this pattern. It's like our core pattern. We won this award for best HR AI and, um, and that's one of the primary patterns is you, like you come into work and you have this like feed and it's just pulling from relevant things happening. And, and some of the feeds are from humans in the company, but others are AI created, not in the like, oh, we don't want like, let's block bots from creating feeds, but more in the like, no, we want bots to create feeds because <laughs> um, it's watching the logs and but but we want it constrained within these algorithms. We don't want it just, you know, making up stuff. Um, and so within the rails of like not hallucinating, we want it to make feeds within sort of rule sets and under domains, as you talked about, and then having these two things work together to say, oh, wait, I can get a new laptop. That's great. And blah, 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 blah. Um, so it just to, I just think it's, it's interesting to, to think about it in the company. I mean, that's HR is a little narrower, but more operational um, Wait, kind of idea. When that information is delivered, and, and, and Josh, you're talking about the the conversational aspect, it, it's, very, it's very human, right? We're, we're having a conversation here. Uh, and so I think there's a, the, the medium creates trust like yeah. it, it, because it's a very human way of communicating. If you can communicate with me in that human way, I will, I may trust you more. I might think you're human. Yeah. And it, I, I, I don't know. Um, if you remember like a long time ago when the start of CGI movies came out, of uh, like Final Fantasy, and there is a Tom Hanks movie going to the North Pole, kid book. Uh, Polar Express. Oh, Polar Express. Yeah, quite and, frightening. Yeah, it's like there's this visual, the kind of uncanny valley of CGI. Yeah. What what is yeah. what is the uncanny valley of conversational AI? Is, yeah. Is there such a thing where humans are kind of like, I think you're human, I can't quite tell, um, and, and it starts to come back to another topic, just the trust piece again. Like, do I, do I trust this? It's rolling all of this up and it's presenting this information to me. Feels very human. It's delivered very human. Do I, do I naturally trust it to then follow through with whatever it's trying to tell me? Yeah. Well, we've talked about like this. There's a really high level of uh, orchestration required to design these kind of experiences yeah. for that reason alone, right? And you have to, it's almost like you, you don't always want it operating at full strength. Like if it, if it starts finding patterns that make you uncomfortable or, you know, doing things yeah. that fall outside that trust zone. But then there's, yeah, obviously areas where it'd be good to have a lot of sophistication. We've talked about this a lot. Like, um, I think one, one angle of the Uncanny Valley for me is when these systems start making mistakes, not in unpredictable ways to us, but in the same ways that humans make them. Hey. So when it starts... <laughs> screwing up the way we screw up the, and this, so they become somewhat predictable and 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 more forgivable because because it the mistakes it made is is in the same way humans make mistakes i think that's like a form of uncanny valley where, un, uncanny valley where you're like okay it made a a mistake that i could make 
oh, I, you know, where, where we say that, like, oh, it's, 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 you know, anybody could make that mistake, right? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. when we like find ourselves saying that to a, a bot, oh, anyone could make, wait, you're, no, you're not an anyone. Um, <laughs> that's probably like a, a, one lens, right? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I trust it more in one sense now, but now I'm also a little suspicious because why did it make that blunder? Well, yeah. It, yeah. It's more like me. Like, is that what I want? And, and ex extend that into like cultural communication differences. Think of, uh, Southern European or Latin American cultures where there's a lot of relationship building in order to like gain trust or just to like get to a point. How's mm. your kids? How's your mom? How's the weather? Uh, how is lunch? You know, all of that sort of fluff around the edges creates a very sort of human connection. And then you right. s to eventually get to the point where you look at other cultures that are much more just to the point, give me the direction, give me the answer. Um, it, it feels like another possible, like, like the comply slider. It's the, uh, yeah. the, you know, give me the direct, very authoritative direction and just the facts, ma'am versus yeah you know let's let's chat about this let's riff on this before actually getting yeah. to whatever you're trying to tell me yeah like sh shoot the shit mode yeah <laughs> yeah look at that. <laughs> all right we got two sliders we've now. been talking a lot <laughs> <laughs> we've been talking a lot about the idea of kind of like a, a shared ai um within a team or an organization you know that knows enough that it can be really useful to people across departments and things like that so in that sense it is almost like yeah, but we've been calling it kind of like our AI, but, but there are elements of it that would then verge into my AI with what you're talking about, right? Like people would, it would behoove the organization to have that AI be able to communicate with people based on their cultural differences yes. or just based on their slider settings. So it's interesting that it, it, it is sort of, it could be thought of as like kind of a, a single organizational AGI, but then it has all these different, uh, versions of itself. So that if you were looking at someone else's slack window and seeing what the ag or the you know the bot was saying to them it might seem like a different uh, system but it would really yeah. kind of be the same system what is what is what does representation mean in ai content delivery you know if, if, if yeah. different peoples relate to each other based on their background and shared experiences and you know country of origin creed gender etc what does that mean in terms of my trusting of the information being given to me by a machine that has none of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's so yeah, funny. The, the anthropomorphic part of sharing information. If you shared information with me and then, and then I brought it up to you later. Right. So it's like you shared that you are lactose intolerant. And then later I got you a latte and I said, oh, milk. Cause I know, you know, yeah, <laughs> we don't want the farts. Um, and then I, <laughs> But then you didn't tell me, like something, someone else told me, and I brought it over. Almost creepy, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, especially if you bring so, up farts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> that's a, it's like, yeah. That yeah. 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 When you're when you're <laughs> when your AI accidentally farts, that's that's <laughs> yeah. the uncanny valley, right? Like, oh, excuse me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's lacto pro lacto <laughs> fart tolerant AI. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're like, wait a second. Um. Yeah, I, it, that that idea, like I had, because we were talking about this, like, is it, is it, is is the future like my AI, like my AI that talks to every AI, so I'm gonna have one like her, you know, um, or is it like your AI? I'm gonna talk to your AI, or is my AI gonna talk to your AI? <laughs> um, or is it our AI, which is kind of where where we've gone, which is we're going to share AIs and there's going to be lots of AIs and I'm going to talk to them all and some will be group AIs and, or, or I'm going to have two AIs or five AIs that argue with each other about whether I yeah. should eat a donut or not. Um, and that IOT thing, it, like is, a, is my camera an AI that I can talk to and say, Hey, anybody come by today? Um, Oh yeah, there were three people that came by. Your mom came by and your ex girlfriend, um, but luckily not at the same time. Um, and you're like, oh, thank you. And, and so, like, 
I, I think there's like an ongoing conversation right now about like, are you just going to have your AI that talks to all these other AIs and like one interface or, or are you going to have these relationships, multiple relationships with many of these AIs? Um, that way you subscribe to them in the way you do like streaming services. Yeah. You have well, and, like and, and using your, AIs. using your camera metaphor, am I talking to my camera or am I talking to my front door? Am I talking to my house? Like, right. what's the thing that I think, because people are in here. Yeah, is like, it all nested? Physical. Yeah. What, right. What, what's, what's the relationship that you then want to make? If I go to, if I go to work, if I'm in an office, now I'm in kind of a different environment. If I go to my doctor, I'm in a different environment. Is it the same AI following me around? Like, you know, her in your ear, kind of like a pseudo girlfriend in a way, but, um, when we start giving the IOT world more and more sensors and more and more capabilities to see the world, understand the right. world, what is the sort of grounding object that we as humans are addressing? Exactly. What? Like maybe the anthropomorphic thing is a phase, right? Because that's what limits us in our ability to like make sense of, wait, am I talking to the house or the camera in the house or like yeah. ah, i'm so confused like who who am i talking to like no it's not who it's what oh got it okay now the world just made sense again mm -hmm. like i don't need a, they're not who's they're what's and and it, yeah i talked to oh ask the camera blah 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 or i'm gonna ask the house which talks to the camera like okay now now this all makes sense and and maybe you know maybe the anthropomorphic thing just that adds to the confusion, right? You know, of, I think of people's what's really relationships happening. to technology like comes in heavily too, right? Because if you're a kind of a voracious consumer of technology who who is excited about the possibility to kind of design your own automations and kind of automate your life, the idea of having a personal AI that knows a lot about you, even picks up on things about you you don't know, like that might not be as unsettling. But there will be people probably who 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 will need to use this technology or want to use it in limited cases, but they might not want, they might want like more of an our AI experience where yeah. like my friends, I'll use this AI. It's really good at getting them good, you know, a good deal on a car or something yeah. like I'll go ahead and use this one, but I don't want it to know everything about me. I only want it to know, um, which might just be a perceptual yeah. thing at some point. It, yeah. but, is it, is it creepy how the AI finds out your information if you absolutely trust that it has your best interests in mind and privacy in mind? Yeah, it's a really good question. It's mm -hmm. a really good question. Like uh, the and, lactose and some, intolerance piece. I, 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 yeah. I want this system to know that I'm lactose intolerant. I don't care how it found out as long as it's not embarrassing me or sharing it with others because I right. know and I trust that it has my best interests in mind. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that. Or, yeah, or is this idea that like it isn't in it and it's just i don't know like i want my fridge to know that but i don't necessarily want my work fridge to know that maybe or maybe i do <laughs> maybe i don't care <laughs> um and so now we're just deciding which objects we share that i i kind of like think i always like you know i'll be sitting around with my headphone on and and walking and talking you know in a meeting and i realize like you know we're now in a world where talking to yourself, you're not a crazy person. We just, <laughs> yeah, right? And I always think back to like how crazy this would look to someone. And then I go like in the yeah. future, are we just gonna run, walk around our house talking to all our objects? Like, hi, logs, what's up today? Hello, plant, <laughs> how are you feeling? And <laughs> how crazy will that look? <laughs> we're just like get home and just go around talking to the objects in our house. Um, yeah, how are you doing? Yeah. Uh, and they talk back, you know, and, and, or they maybe just You're slightly click. less lonely. As you said, <laughs> as you said, like, maybe they don't talk back. They click like our plants just, how you doing? Click. Oh, yeah, I was click, reading click, a click. study that like, uh, they found that plants are generally pretty silent, but when they're, um, when they're in distress, like if they need water or they're sick, they emit like a, maybe it's a really low frequency clicking sound. So we were we were thinking like I mean wow. sure Alexa yeah. could or you know your home speaker could be trained to hear that frequency and let yeah. you know like hey your hydrangea needs hydration yeah so how are you doing I I, I'm thirsty man like 
dude, <laughs> yeah. where have you been? What? You're like, oh, oh what yeah, do you I... mean? Uh, what do you mean, where have I been? <laughs> well, the camera says, here. the camera told me you haven't been around in a while. Oh, Woof. I told the camera not to tell you, talk to you. You guys can't talk to each other anymore. Well, it, uh, Internet of Things is a really fascinating realm because it, it feels like, and this could just be my perception, but like 10 years ago when I was working at UX Magazine, I was reading and writing and editing a lot of articles about the Internet of Things and all the possibilities that this would unlock. And then I think there was kind of the, the cold reality that there was no real ecosystem in place for these <clears throat> things to communicate in a meaningful way. But now it feels like we're on the verge of a moment where where that all that stuff's possible. We just now we just kind of need to reignite the excitement around designing these experiences because now the the tools are, are way more accessible and available. Yeah. You know, there's there's power struggles between communication standards and who's going to kind of own the interface to all of this because that's then the portal that allows everything to um, maybe be monetized or turn into a business in some way. And so the big boys were having all of their struggles. And as soon as a lot of those standards start to come into place and they can talk to each other and it, it, it evens out the field. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot more opportunity. I think, I mean, you're speaking, I think more in the consumer space, um, in the industrial space though, the thing that I don't, and I have to, I have to give a little shout out here, the industrial space for design and AI is fascinating. And I think it's oh, very, yeah. very understated in terms of like shininess that designers tend to be attracted towards it's a little more grubby but it's very meaningful it's very like got a lot of purpose to it but the investment in the equipment and the communication and what you can do in there there's a there's a whole lot more bill of material opportunity to do iot work on big industrial equipment and pull data off of that and do really really interesting stuff yeah um, that the consumer space is now just kind of getting its standards bodies together and its normalization together to do some of the same sort of yeah. thing. Yeah. Well, that I guess points to a moment too where like it would be a liability for a company not to be able to take part yeah. in some sort of uh, conversation between yeah. companies and systems and things like that. I think where productivity is like, you know, the home, I, I've argued this many times. That I don't know that the home is like, is like the place to focus on productivity. Like, I don't know that that's where we, <laughs> but the factory, heck yeah. Right. And, yeah. and, and when you think of like, where is AI supposed to be talking about the home where, where it's a place for creativity more than productivity. Like why, why, why is that where most of these devices are and not in the factory? Why, yeah. why do more homes have virtual assistants and factories yeah I, I i don't i don't want an efficient experience with my kid <laughs> yes. that, like how many pictures did you make today <laughs> you're slowing down you're slowing down you made three thousand yesterday those blisters yeah, I, on your hands must be slowing you down <laughs> uh but you know a application to that in the industrial space has all sorts of opportunities and and one of the things I, I, I kind of want to breach with you guys here is um, is productivity, but also like knowledge retention, knowledge transfer. Um, in, in GE, we, we had this reference to what we called the machine whisperer, the uh -huh. guy that can go over and like just put his hand on something and know exactly what bolt needs to be tightened or what belt needs to yeah. be replaced because, because I don't know, because they know that because they've been yeah, working on this the for 30, 40 years. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, yeah. But, but those, those, those guys are retiring. Those guys are like leaving the workforce and, and the knowledge that they've gained throughout an entire career of doing this sort of work in a very niche, but very important area, um, will leave with them. Yeah. Rob, you had a similar experience in uh, the movie industry when, when you were working in sound departments as as uh, things were switching from analog to digital. And all these people who understood uh -huh. the, the, the hand working aspect of cutting film and the, the I think we've called it like the rhythmic element of editing. Yeah. Like that that was at risk of being scuttled completely if, yeah. if uh, 
all of a sudden film houses were just hiring people who knew how to use computers but didn't understand the patterns right. of editing, which is is similar like to what you're describing, David. Yep. Like that that knowledge, it would be criminal almost to let that knowledge just slip out the door and not yeah. at least try and well, let find me be, ways to bake it into these systems. Let me be the optimist and kind of take this full circle and say, look, you know, I talked about a base pattern to help teach, right? Like creating posts and then asking, what if the AI can get really good at teaching us so that those guys never leave, right? Because, because what they know gets institutionalized into the system and and then they can pass that knowledge on to to anyone who comes in and so so they stay forever they live forever right i'm not talking about consciousness and their whole brain i'm just yeah. talking about their skills like because you could amount this knowledge you could break their knowledge into a series of skills some skills harder more rare some skills more common but what if those skills could be captured and you just put a device that even a simple device that you, you just put this little device with a ball bearing on it on the machine and the degree of vibration changes the the frequency right of of the sound emitted by the ball bearing in the little whatever thing and then you yeah. have something that picks up the frequency and then can be like oh the bolt on the left is loose again yeah um because so, the whisperer told it. The whisperer yeah, was so, like, that, so that vibration could, is this belt. Yeah, so, so you're almost like, hey, before you leave, make sure you're training the AI for what you know, <laughs> right? Um, I, like, it's great that you've tried to train these people, but what if they leave? Um, and and it's like, oh, that gets, that gets interesting. I mean, it sucks because maybe that guy becomes less valuable and and that's, you know, that's sort of part of our social hierarchy um and so maybe we have to find a way to replace that but um but from a from a productivity standpoint that could be pretty awesome that we're always building upon the knowledge of the the collective knowledge of all the people together before us it's the whole if hp knew what hp knows we'd be a much better company that whole idea of like what if all of this all of this this institutional knowledge could get amalgamated together and tr and tr transferred to the next people um forever but rob, rob now 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 do that continuously do that I know. with with feedback yeah. loops and so um yeah, i've explained this before imagine imagine if you went through k to 12 grade and that's all you've ever learned your learning stops yeah. at that point because the we we compiled the model at 12th grade and now you're just executing <laughs> off of the model on your K through 12 learning. And there's no uh, intake of additional knowledge. There's no growing of what you know to be true. If the world changes and your K through 12 model doesn't apply, sorry. Uh, yeah. How, how do we intentionally build that, that continual feedback loop, that continual learning loop? So the model isn't trained and deployed the model is continuing to pick up additional feedback, additional insights, additional information. So when you say if only HP knew what HP knew, well, what if could they could they keep knowing? <laughs> Can they yeah. keep learning? And, yeah. I love this. So I we we talk about this as CRUDs, like as in CRUD, you know, create, read the mm. yeah. s s uh, but we add an S to the end. So imagining that with generative you have create, read update delete and seek yeah. so imagine that you put and i'm using this symbolically like imagine you put a, a new column in the table called favorite color and then the second you added that column all of a sudden it starts filling in because generative went out and and texted people in the company what's your favorite color like the second you added it it went out to seek and and it all of a sudden just starts filling this out because because you just added this this you know piece of data and then you go let's take it out of a table and put it in a graph db right and it's even more interesting because now we have connections and relationships between it and and so you almost have like this this cellular component where you come up with something that you want to know 
you put it into the system and it goes seeks that information. And then you're like, would be great to know this. And oh, I'll go find it. And it uses people in the IoT, but it also uses, it may ask your plant, it may ask your camera, it may ask the people. <laughs> and so you're just sitting there like dreaming up things that the system, you want the system to know. And it's just out there seeking it. And then running it past you, you're like, hey, what do you think? This is what I found out. And you're like, yeah, yeah, we should remember that. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm in love with this idea of creds with an S. I just think you add seek to it and it's just like, whoa, what, what does the world look like when, when, when systems seek out the data um, yeah. no, and that's, populate it? That's super. And, and, then, and then the more... The more new ideas come into the fray, the more those are included. You know, back right. to your HP knows of HP knows. Well, what happens when they hire some new hotshot PhD fresh out of school who has all sorts of great ideas and ambition? Does HP now know that as well? Is that included now so, into? Yeah, has that been right? You get and rolled in. Yeah, yeah. If I pay you for an hour of time, am I entitled to all your knowledge forever? <laughs> 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 um, do i have to so, do i have to give it back to you after the hours time's up like yes. nope i'm taking it with me sorry yeah, that belongs yeah. to me who's whose knowledge is that do i do i get your past knowledge or do i just get the knowledge that you gained during that hour man um it's, it's our knowledge it's our <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> i like it David, what what's the appetite like for automation uh, in in the industrial space? Is it um, like we're seeing a lot of companies? Uh, we consider it folly to kind of look at it as like a short term cost cutting uh, measure instead of you know taking the long view. But what's that look like in the industrial space? Or is it focused more on like kind of what we're talking about? Like how far can we take this? How can we make our whole systems more efficient? Or is it more about like how can I? Uh, make more widgets, um, fewer people. I, I, I think there is a, a bit of uh, w one aspect is like protecting what we have, making sure we don't lose what we've we've put together here. And um, Rob, like you said, companies are just like a whole bunch of rules. Uh -huh. uh, how do how do we organize all of that? How do we use this to then execute those rules and move through our system in a much more productive way? Productivity aspect. Um, there's other there's other companies and there's a there's a quick story I can mention um, if you like that I think is like what what's the entire business model that we can drive by leveraging this information and the one that uh, pretty pretty known and kind of a public um, uh, understanding um, I'll, I'll abstract this a little bit imagine I sell a multi million dollar piece of equipment to you at cost uh. except. I want, as part of this, for all of the servicing of that equipment to be done by me. And the part's done okay. by me, and you can't use anybody else's parts, and you can't use any other people. And so for five or 10 years, I've got lock in on the service for that big piece of equipment. So it's like my uh, inkjet printer. Uh, uh, <laughs> kind of. You only buy ink from me. Here's, here's, here's the deal. I will guarantee that this piece of equipment runs for that 10-year period that we are under contract. That's not but it. I need to know all of the operational data coming off of that piece of equipment. Uh, I need to know, are you running it in a desert? I, I are you running knowledge. it in... Um, I need to see what's happening. I, and ownership, is, eh, let's talk about ownership, but at least visibility into I, I'm, I have access being to the knowledge. Yes. I have access yes. to the knowledge. Yep. And that then allows me to look at, if I sell Josh a piece of equipment and he's running it in the desert with a bunch of sand and a lot of yeah. heat it's going to wear differently and perform differently than the same piece of equipment i sold to rob who's running uh -huh. it in a pristine laboratory that's completely conditioned so my obligation to keep this piece of equipment running for 10 years is going to be very different for josh than it is for rob oh and i want God. to you just... minimize my cost on keeping that equipment running you just crack my mind wide open here to like, we have data privacy for people. What about the things now? Now that these things can think, do they have data privacy or is the, does it, 
Does mm-hmm. that privacy extend to the person who owns it or the person who built it or the Oof, people who use it? uses it? The person operating <laughs> it? The person yeah. servicing so, it? Because there yeah. are people that float around this in some way to keep that machine running or feeding right. it more inputs or taking whatever it's producing. Yeah. Um, you have a system that produces logs, like in, in your example, in the simplest form, you have a system that produces logs. Are those logs shared? Uh, who gets to decide? And like you said, is that a, can someone make that a condition of purchasing it? And and, um, and, and Rob, I hear you say logs. I, I you know think I think about that in terms of like time series data coming off of a raw sensor. Yeah, yeah, what, yeah. What is the temperature of that thing at this moment? And then depending upon the sensor resolution and the vastness of your historian that could be an yeah. absolute ton of data wow and what if it has facial recognition oh uh, yeah <laughs> well <laughs> now we, that's we, in there well you, we we do have in the industrial space big uh not only security concerns but safety concerns so and, uh, is the person coming up to this piece of equipment authorized trained and allowed to mm, use it to i love that um and there have been projects that I've seen where, you know, not just like the badging in and out, but we look to see, is this the person that we can then check against? Who is it? What's their, is their training up to date? Uh, and then, you know, h- how is their safety and performance history to make sure that they continuously operate this or maintain this in a way that is compliant and safe? Wow. Yeah, face recognition has like such a heaven and hell component to it, you know? Yep. Yeah. Like that is fantastic. Like you're talking about saving lives, really. I mean, at an industrial level, we're talking about yeah. saving lives. Smarter machines like, oh, that's that's not a two by four. That's a finger. Like that matters. That that like huge saving somebody uh, the loss of a limb. Like what is that worth? Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. On the other hand, you know, observing, you know, how, you at work and 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 big brothering, like how productive are you, um, and how much time do you spend talking to your peers versus like focusing on work? Ooh, um, and then saying next s- somehow you could just say no face recognition yes face recognition it really has to be like skills based you know it's just a sensor yeah so it, what we have to do is maybe like just focus on not the general use of these things but the specific use of them find a way anyway and, and back to the what is the human component in all of this you know, as right. AIs get smarter and start to act or be able to do things that are more human, um, either out of, um, I'll say, philosophy or out of necessity, what yeah. what are the things that humans need to do? And I think for design to go spend their time in that realm and really understand a, a principled perspective on these decisions are squarely, uniquely human and should remain that way. Or these sorts of roles are things that humans will always do better in some way than machines. And this is the relationship that we have to create from a human perspective. Yeah, we had this discussion too the other day. We were, we were talking about like digital twins, the idea of like, <laughs> yep. it's kind of a popular idea, um, digital twins of organizations. And then we were talking about digital twins of people. And it seemed like the, if you, if we go back, I guess, kind of the my AI route, but if you were going to have a piece of technology that was in, and as in theory, your digital twin, for it to actually be useful, it wouldn't really be a digital twin. It would be more like a digital relief, right? Like it would, it would augment the things that you're not particularly good at and maybe find ways to make you better at other things. But it wouldn't, you wouldn't really want something that was really good at doing what you're already really good at. It would almost make more sense for it to, to even the design wise, to come at the approach of like, how, how do I fill in holes? Not how do I uh, copy what's, I guess it's that other thing we talk about too. It's like, are we, designing automations to automate the way things are done now, or are we looking for ways to create experiences that are better, that use technology more wisely and orchestrated to create better experiences than 
humans alone could provide. So I've, I've, I've seen the digital twin space most successfully applied in running scenarios. Um, yeah, I, I, agree. I, I, yeah. I can't, I can't, I don't want to see what it's like to crash this car into a brick wall at 60 uh-huh. miles an hour, even though, you know, that still happens with test dummies and such. But if we have the ability to replicate that environment and replicate those conditions, we can then create that over and over and over and over again with slight changes to the environment and understand what happens in that digital twin space. Um, Good. And it, if if you have the modeling and computing power to recreate all of that, which can be very vast, especially in the industrial space, or if you want to talk about modeling a human, that's even more complex. Uh, but but Josh, like, yeah. what what do you do with it? You have a twin. Now, what do you do with it? That yeah. to me is well, the scenarios. And- it gets specifically interesting for me when you broaden, because a lot of people think of a twin as like an exact re- like 3D replica of a physical thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but when we think of it in more of an abstract way, I like the idea that plant may be an idea in the twin, not an actual physical representation of the plant. Um it's just an idea. And when I talk to the plant, it's not that the plant has a speaker and voice recognition attached to the flower bot or the, the, it's that it's just in your digital twin that that plant exists in that twin. And when you refer to the plant, you're really referring to a digital version of it in the twin. And now you can broaden what goes into the twin to tasks and tickets and errors and logs and all yeah. kinds of ideas and you go like now you have this really high fidelity digital twin and now you run simulations like you said you you run them on like n- now now the crash dummy scenario you could add mood mm-hmm. to the scenario like what's the mood of the driver let's Let's imagine they're really pissed off at their kid in the back seat. Boom. Yeah. Now run that let's run. Yeah, run that scenario, which you can't do in the crash dummy physical world, right? Because yeah. Well, I, I don't know if you can't, but it's I wouldn't I wouldn't know how I'd approach that, but wouldn't be cost effective. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but, but Rob, what I used to say is like you you only really need to digitize the twinned parameters that are meaningful to the scenarios that you want to run. Yes. You don't, yeah, uh, low uh, fidelity versus high. Yeah, you don't need every detail. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just like like a lot of other design problems. If I want to draw a picture of something, I can go over to whiteboard and I can grab a marker and I can get my point across with a very yeah. small amount of information transferred from my marker to your eyeballs. Um, right. Same idea. Like, what do I need to replicate in a digital twin? What information is meaningful? To, to get the point across and execute the scenario or execute this thing that I want to run. It's wild to think of, of that fat, like technology, a, a big facet of it becoming this communication layer that just exists yeah. in our homes, at work, and where you're, it's, you're a node in that system and you're, you're a, an important node because you're being fed information that lets you make decisions, but then you're <laughs> also giving back information. And then there's also a class of information that gets relegated. Like I don't, I don't need to hear from my refrigerator on a daily basis, but there might be instances where I need to know that like my yeah. ice maker's clock yeah. or something like no, that. No, but maybe your digital twin does needs to hear from it on a minute by minute basis or hour by hour I, basis. And uh, yeah, you don't need to be in on that conversation. With the refrigerator. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I yeah. think, I think if you mix creds like seek with digital twin to your point of like going from low fidelity to high fidelity, now you have like a twin that's like, on its own sort of generating fidelity um, hey. and improving your scenarios, right? You're like, oh, this thing's like, it's kind of like the, the the vacuum that says, oh, the chair moved and you just remap Ooh. it. So keeping that twin up to date and, and improving fidelity so that, like you said, it's learning. Well, it's not really learning. What it's doing is it's creating higher fidelity and that's creating better simulations. So if you can tie your digital twin to its physical real world twin Ooh. and have it start to then yeah. draw contextual real information off of whatever it's wired to 
Yeah. And then use that information to then evolve the twin in a way that's based off of reality. It exactly. could start to fill in those blanks. Yeah. And, yeah. and if that monitoring isn't like a direct, but an indirect, like as in you're listening to the plants high frequencies from a monitor that is separate from the plant that just monitors all kinds of audio in your house at all frequencies. So it's feeding back the plant. Fidel that that fidelity is being fed by a monitor. It's not mm -hmm. the plant itself. And now you get into this like constantly monitoring the systems, like you said, creating fidelity through these monitoring systems. And then humans are one of those systems. Yeah, the sensors You're that a are super creating sensor fidelity. In the system. Yeah, right. So it's sitting there listening to our conversation right now and feeding the digital twin from the the data that we're talking about and creating fidelity, making changes, updating it as we're just communicating with each other as a third party monitor. Yeah, um, I like this idea. And, this, this this whole this whole idea of like a digital twin that's tied to its physical real world equivalent or multiples right. of those to then sort of grow the twin based off of the realities of what's happening around it exactly it's like this it's like this this virtual world that still obeys the laws of physics so that it so that so that you're able to create real world scenarios um yeah super interesting and then it gets crazy and we won't go there Another conversation where we can talk about the virtual twin that doesn't obey the laws of physics. <laughs> <laughs> we get into the quantum world, like, whoa, yeah. okay. <laughs> There's something interesting there, though, thinking in like a company setting, if, if there are multiple digital twins of different people that are all, you know, growing and learning and seeking information... That would eventually probably lead to a cross pollination of twins, and then it just becomes kind of this Ish. the company instead of being yeah. just a set of rules becomes almost this shared consciousness. Man, I love that, that exists, because uh, graphs. If you're yeah. if you're a geek on graphs like I am, you realize that especially with LLMs, you can merge graphs together. You can have a graph, a twin of of your your point of view of of a space or a company. I can have my twin. And then we can mind meld like Spock and we can put our graphs together. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of go like, whoa, how do we, now we can, and, and we can ask questions to this like new graph, which is not my graph or your graph, but we can talk to the graph that is a combination of the two graphs. So we can Ooh. ask questions on two perspectives of the world, which is like this layered ontology that we might have now. So you get two graphs and you get a layered ontology in the graph and now we start at so we go, wow, what happens if I take my company, merge it with your company, and then ask questions about what are the common learnings? What are the things that we've learned in common? What are the things we do differently? Like, mm. whoa, this is like yeah. a whole new world for consulting, right? Like, oh, we're going to take our, our graph of the ideal company that doesn't exist, and we're going to merge it with your graph of your company, and then we're going to look at the delta and that's going to come up with a list of to do's. <laughs> or, or, you, or you get the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde situation where, where it yeah. gets, or the uh, Bruce Banner and the Incredible Hulk situation or oh, they're yeah. the same, but they're conflicting in some way. What if those graphs have entirely contrary ideas or contrary experiences from their past about certain situations? How do they resolve those? Mm -hmm. how, how do you kind of come to terms to say? Yeah. Uh, yeah, hmm. we simulated a merger of our two companies and uh, things look pretty good. Things look pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to talk to it? <laughs> wow. Yeah. What, what could you, what would you ask your future company? Or a, yes. a, 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 uh, nice. Yeah, and it was, yeah, you could pose all sorts of hypotheticals too. It seems like you could run simulations galore on just business decisions that could have major repercussions 10 years down the road mm -hmm. that you wouldn't that there might be a blind spot for yeah, this, uh, this like reminds people. me of like a two people getting together with having like like in our lee hood episode where digital twin of you but not in the just purely physical form but in the 
abstract form of moods and and relationships with people and all of these things kind of high fidelity digital twin and then imagining like the new dating paradigm where we like join our twin together and figure out like the options of of like our offspring digital twins yeah or <laughs> or, or maybe you'd want like uh <laughs> Maybe you'd want uh, two versions of your digital twin. You want like the the cranky, cynical version of yourself, and then you want the optimistic one too. And they yeah. can hash out decisions like, should I should I be a little more cautious here, or should I just yeah go crank, with my blind cranky optimism? Josh says yes. Yeah, th- th- cranky <laughs> Josh is warning me. You've heard the uh, like if you if you could resurrect some famous person from the past and have a conversation or a coffee with them, who who, who would that be? I wonder how much knowledge has been lost from experts in different domains or the, the titans of industry or oh just genius people that, um, you know, maybe maybe lived well before the computer age yeah. and had fantastic mm-hmm. ideas about things that if we're directly reapplied to what we're doing now with all the power of AI and all the power of the internet and computing, what what would they do? Yes. Yeah. What if, we, yeah, what, if we, what if we didn't just compound the knowledge that's been written and acknowledged broadly, but we compounded all the knowledge, right? <laughs> and, yeah, let's and, take it all. And anyone can write because, because they just have to talk. They don't have to be writers and they don't have to be read to share knowledge into the world. Um, yeah. Crazy I think idea. You just described Chat GPT, didn't you? I think I did. Except that <laughs> it still has this like probability yeah. probability component that says if if one person had a great idea off somewhere, but it's not going to read. You know, it's not going it, to. It, a lot of people have to talk about that idea. Um, oh yeah, yeah. But it, take, like we got to we got to look in the depths of of side conversations. Like finding diamond in the rough. We kind need of the seek ideas. We that need have been that lost. seeking, not just the. Not to just, yeah, we, we need that seat. Comp- go go find me a really smart person talking about this and tell me what they think of yeah, or this we, idea. Or we don't want like the 100 most shared quotes from Winston Churchill. We want that deep cut yeah, where he was sure. talking about something, you know. Yeah, we want to know what he World said. He talks in his sleep. We want to know what he talks about. <laughs> yeah. Well, then if you can ask the system generally or, you know, if, if you ask, chat gbt to write a poem and then you say write it in the you know shakespearean tone or voice you can like hone it in to a certain theme or style could you do that then with a certain mind a certain scientist a certain philosopher give me their perspective on this topic um yeah the the uh, pessimistic version of them the optimistic version (laughs) I yeah, want them yeah. to argue with two versions of themselves. I want to know what's going on in their head as they argue yeah. the same point with each other Eesh. from opposite sides. Have them debate this point in front of me. <laughs> 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 then I'll make up my mind because I want agency. I don't want... <laughs> yeah. Woof. Yeah, and that's what it comes back to, right? Like, where, wh- where are we? What note are we? Where is our place in this whole ecosystem and as it becomes more and more we've we've just made the water very muddy i think but also clear in a way funny how that works hey, uh, what yeah what is what is what is people's role what's human's role when we get to this because it's i don't i don't think it seems like we're talking about completely crazy stuff it sounds crazy we're not, but, it is. but a year or two ago it sounded even more crazy and five no, years this ago is, ten years this ago, is like but it's this it's, is happening it's here yeah it's it's yeah. the it's the whole like lot bot you know the conversation we had with idea guys like it just makes it just tells you if there's a parking spot available at work and then <laughs> we easily went oh or a desk available or what project you're working on or what project you should be working and the next thing you know is running the company yeah so slippery yeah. slope to all of that uh-huh yeah and not in, and not well, in yeah, the that, bad that's way what we're really designing. in the good way in the helpful way yeah <laughs> Well, it feels like in a way that's that's the design challenge, or maybe that's what we hope people would be designing, or people are unwittingly designing is our place in this new yes. world, right? Like yes, that, that, th- Josh. those are the decisions we're making right now. So, what are, what are you seeing on the ground? Like, uh, where are these conversations happening? What 
you know, is it, it, is it the, the engineers building, building the machines and, and working on the, you know, uh, uh, on the factory floor, so to speak? Um, or is it up in the management layer that are trying to make mm-hmm. those people on the floor more productive? Like where, who's having I, these wild conversations? Well, I, I I see two. Well, this is broadly it's outside of industry, but I see two slices. If there's those, there's those that are trying to use AI to improve what they're doing right now in some way, like using ChatGPT to do something better in some way. Um, and so it's application of AI into an existing operation or something. Then there's those that say, no, I want to. I don't want to use ChatGPT. I want to build AI. I want to actually make my own AI and leverage this in some particular place that um, the current tool doesn't exist. Yeah, I think from a executive level and the, the the business leaders that I've spoken to, there's a lot of interest in both of those. Like they see kind of the magic happening, maybe not necessarily understanding all of its application, lots of exploration. Everybody's kind of fumbling around and learning from each other uh, broadly. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunity to like test some stuff, try some stuff, see what happens. Um, but more so in the application of AI into existing spaces, I think less so, and this is the part that I'm really interested in, how, how do we build these AIs? How do we build these feedback loops? How do we gather all this information and apply it in a, a domain different than the tools that are out there right now or focused on? Yeah. Yeah, you. Um, I, I was talking to Elias earlier, and he was mentioning that you you were at a UX conference, and yeah, um, and you were he he relayed that you were like, okay, great, let's talk some AI design, and everyone was talking about the technology, um, and you're like, well. It, Wait, like looking at the conference pamphlet again. Am I in the wrong conference? Um, and, and and I was like, is this why that is this why that maybe it's it's still ground level? Is like everyone's talking about the the nuts and bolts of this versus the design, and that we need to move the conversation to design patterns and 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 those sorts of things, and then we can engage more holistically or. So I, 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 AI is a technology. Technologies are tools. Tools are used to go solve problems in some way. And if you don't have a good problem, you're a tool looking for a problem. All right. Uh, and so I think people see a lot of the various AI tools out there right now, and they're trying to apply them towards their design process or to amplify their creativity or come up with new ideas that they haven't thought of before. Um, I'll say I I work in a space that has lots of problems, lots of potential applications for this sort of thing. And yeah. it's in a way that I I feel excited to pursue. I feel excited in like a positive net good way because we work on energy optimization. We work on equipment and asset health. We work on safety. We work on things that are, um, if we're to gather all this information, and it's not necessarily like human behavioral information. How long did you look at this ad? Did you click on this thing from a like e-commerce or marketing site perspective? It's more about manufacturing. It's more about maintenance and building things. Our source data is much more, I mean, much more flexibly applied. Not as much sort of moral and ethical questions about this data coming from machines as if or compared to if it was coming from you know humans or people that happen to yeah. come to your website um so we have a lot of problems plus we have a lot of data so we have kind of a, a good sweet mix in the industrial space to go think about applying all of this in ways and exploring it all um and, and to add to that it, it it's um if you're in the right spot in industry which i think i am looking at energy optimization, electrification of the world and all of the transformation to clean energy, uh, it it feels very good. It feels like a thing that I want to go pursue and I want to apply some 
you know, smarts of the world towards and would advocate for others to do the same. Yeah, I was, um, I was thinking about that. Um, the idea that, that I, I think manufacture is just so right because of the complexity and we're yeah. talking about supply yeah. chain, like things like supply chain and repairs yeah. and, and staff organizing staff and teams and coordination yeah. and just really simple coordination, not no, complex coordination stuff, um, that people don't want to do. Um, or it's if hard. they do, they do pretty badly and, and you want it done consistently. Uh, and, and so I think like there's, there's kind of like no end, no ends to it. It's like a playground <laughs> yeah. of, of where to begin. But that whole thing of where to begin, it's not to talk about the technology. It's to talk about the design patterns and the use cases. Um, yes. Yes. And I've, I find in most of my conversations that when I start talking use cases and we've kind of brought up a bunch here and we could probably go on forever. Um, that's where people get most engaged. Like yes. and s some folks just want, want me to sit down and just rattle off use cases to them. Like, just, can you just rattle off like a hundred use cases, Rob? Um, which is fascinating because it tells you that the world is struggling with all the power of this and everyone going, wow, this is going to be amazing. And then you go, okay, name 10 use cases off the top of your head that you think would transform your company. And they're like, uh, write a poem to my <laughs> peer about how much I like working with them. Um, yeah, they really freeze, you know? Um, yep. and I think that's, that's, and now you're going to a UX conference and I would call that the like, group version of I can't come up with the use case so I'm just going to talk about the technology um, that lack of imagination is something I feel like we got to work on and and to me it feels like you know finding muses you know ideas that spur these kinds of conversations um, within the organization that talk more about how to apply this stuff in creative ways not and so what blows my mind is I'll sit there with a UX folk, with UX folks or customers who want to talk about the technology instead of the design. Um, and I don't mind. I can talk technology all day long. Um, but but why do they want to talk about that? <laughs> yeah. um, and, and, I'm, and I'm going, okay, you know, I'm sitting at a UX conference and, or you're sitting at a UX conference or we're having a UX discussion about the technology and... And not the use cases and thinking about um, why. And what always surprises me is like 50% of the time that designer wants to talk about use cases about how they can create the old technology that they're creating every day faster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like how, how can I make o these old apps that I'm still designing that are really going to be like arcane and replaced? How can I do that better and faster using generative AI? I'm, and it just throws me and I'm like, wait, how do you create the outdated <laughs> stuff easier and better? Like that's where we're at. That's, that's, uh, versus... that's, where, that's where people's heads at though. Like that's their like, <laughs> lived experience. And um, when, I was, when I was with GE, I spent a lot of time going and visiting customers and a number of other huge, you know, GE, Schneider scale industrial companies. Um, and what's interesting is that in the commercial space, we've got, you know, salespeople and there's a role called a solution architect. Mm -hmm. And their job is to understand what exactly is the problem. And then they look at all the parts and pieces they could pull out of their technical bag and put together in some way to provide a solution to architect a solution um what if what if that's the easy part what if that's the like snap your fingers right and I, i've got 700 different solutions for you who's who's the problem architect who's the one looking at all <laughs> yes. of this and writing the stories and the structure around those use cases who's doing right. the research and the creative like super pointed view into a company's business to say, oh, this is how you work. And this is who's involved. Right. 
and these are your processes and these are your yes. tools and this is your workflow and all yes, of that. Yes, yes. It's like the, the the Silicon Valley, you know, a, a huge number of logos come out of looking at things like Angie's List or or Excel spreadsheets and then breaking it down into use cases and going, what do people do with Angie's List? Oh, they rent out their apartments. Oh, they, you know, they 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 look for sharing rides. It is. Um, and then these companies have like broken out those use cases into multi-billion dollar corporations, right? Um, and, and so what about looking at how a job that a person does and, and they're like, yeah, peel those little pieces out of what they're doing and say, oh, how could we, how could we look at this from a skill standpoint? Not like how do we replace this person, but we just break their day into these little pieces and then, and then decide like, is this worth automating first of all? And then talk about the design paradigm for that, for that one thing. Yeah. And then can we map it to other people and how many people are also doing this one thing? Um, and it's, it is mind boggling that that's, that's not a common occurrence. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, well, well, generative AI too, though, the, the way it was kind of unleashed on the world, um, you know, the use cases popped up right away, but a lot of them are like personal use cases. Like uh, for a UX designer, there's all that now all these really like fast and efficient and exciting ways to create content and to create, you know, like written word, mm -hmm. imagery, all that stuff. Um, and then there's also maybe that fear component that comes up in what you're saying, like where I am trying, I'm trying to use these tools to create the old thing because I want to show you how I'm still relevant, where yeah. really the, the, the power that UX designers have is, is in their ability to, to identify and solve yeah. problems. It's like the tools are getting more powerful and easy to yeah. use. So like really like Focus in That's on the ability want. to identify I problems. I almost like my limits test now for someone who claims to be an expert in the conversational AI sp space is, can you rattle up a hundred use cases off the top of your head um, that are interesting? Or do you go, uh, password reset? Uh, we could use it for collecting money. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Huh. I, versus I, like, do you know the tech? Can you like tell me what the algorithm is for deep learning? Yeah, yeah I wouldn't I wouldn't claim to be an expert in conversational AI, but in the industrial space, I could probably do something like that, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> for, <laughs> then for you're an expert by, in my book. Things. Yeah. In, in that space, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I don't care if you can if you can build your own deep learning or neural net. Like I don't care. <laughs> that doesn't to me make you an expert uh, I I want to talk to you because because you can rattle off a hundred use cases to apply that technology I, I think that's uh, that's the expert I want to talk to um well, I, don't, I don't remember you said this maxim but it's something like today's solution is tomorrow's problem so so that kind of points to also like a perpetual amount of work to be done right yeah. like the 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 solutions that we roll out today, uh, will event, uh, or maybe that'll that'll become less true as these solutions kind of have their own awareness, right? Of and, and the seat component built in, huh? Yeah. I wonder if that gets broken. Where instead of trying to fix the technology around an old solution to make it still work, it becomes something different. Where solutions now there is no end state to a solution; it's just kind of always growing and evolving. Yeah, I mean, if, at what point in time you you put another coat of paint on the house or you do something else to say no we 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 need to build a new house uh -huh. we we, we, yeah. we can't just like keep thinking about the existing structure as it is and the way that it is and making it shinier yeah just kind of because there's some fundamental things that i think are now changing that people have a hard time like need to scoot way back from yeah. <laughs> what it is that I'm used to seeing and get this view. And that's hard for people. It really is. It it's is. difficult to I get it. extract I yourself. I get it. It's like, it's like if we invented teleportation and someone's like, oh, now I can get from my bed to the bathroom next to my room instantaneously in the morning without getting up. Like, no, <laughs> now, now you can have your bedroom at the top of a mountain and we can have a collective bathroom that's right near this sewage treatment plant and and we can 
we can separate and the house the idea yeah. of a house is gone because that's a paradigm shift that doesn't need to happen anymore and yeah. now you wake up and teleport to some other facility which is a shared set of bathrooms <laughs> planes don't exist anymore building. right cars don't <laughs> exist anymore <laughs> yeah. right big yeah. things happen when that when that occurs uh -huh. yeah i i, I think Teleportation is a fun example because I think that's kind of the same AI paradigm right now. It's like, no, this is this is not you just transporting from your bed to the bathroom. This is exactly as you described, Rob. There are much, much bigger and more significant yes. use cases that I think humanity is having a hard time getting their collective brain wrapped around. Yeah, um, like Star Trek had like the beaming thing, right? Teleportation, and then oh, yeah. and then <laughs> someone's in a jam, and the guy's running down the hallway to try to get him beamed up, you know? And you're like, mm -hmm. why didn't you just beam over there? And by the way, why are you running down the hallway to a button? Why didn't you, like, you have a talking machine. Why, <laughs> like, why are you even going anywhere? Why are you just like, hey, looks like those guys are in trouble. Why do you beam them up? Yeah. Um, because we, we know they have this, but yet, yeah, we're gonna live in this paradigm where someone's sprinting down the hallway, trying to get to the button, that it's a slider, you know, it's not even like a button. It's like sliding them up. Like you got to just don't beam them too fast, not too slow. It's like this fader, you know, it's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. But we need I, I, that, right? To your point, we, we need that. We do. I, and the focus on the use cases piece. I mean, that's, that is key. I, there, there was a, a good, good quote that came out of that conference I went to talking about if your if your business or your operation doesn't have value um, without AI, it may or may not have value with AI. And so think about that before you decide to just jump into the technology. What's the fundamental thing we're solving? What's the problem? What's the use case? What's the situation? Yes. And 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 is there something to solve that's going to help someone yeah. that way? I think the key here is first principle thinking. I think that's what's missing. Like in order to change the paradigm, you have to go up the yeah. problem chain. Yeah. And and I think it's just it it's gotta become not just a nice to have, but almost a discipline within organizations of like, no, no, no. Like this is th this is a this is a habit that's a must, you know? Mm -hmm. Um and and and, and going like we've got to we We've got to take every decision and go up the chain to first principle and then figure out if the paradigm even makes sense anymore. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, I, I, I tell people on my key. team, they need, they need to be like the annoying seven-year-old, like saying, why, 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 why that, why that, you know, nagging, yep. nagging at the executive pant leg there saying, well, why? Yeah. <laughs> and, right. Yeah. Uh, yep. Well, because the shareholders, they're just going to want to paint the house again. Yeah. Most likely. That's right? easy. Like, That'll get you, you the quarter. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. And how do you get them to buy into like, we're going to, we're going to tear this thing down and build it fresh. Uh, yeah. Maybe it is the why. Why are we doing it this way? Yeah. Why? <laughs> you just got to keep bugging them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, awesome. This well, has been a this great has been one. This an incredible yeah. conversation. Yeah. 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 I've this, yeah thanks we you, have guys. traveled. We have We've traveled from teleportation to factories to digital twins. A little of, lactose plants, intolerance and thrown in there. <laughs> plant language. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. The form, my format brought us been discussion fun. to date. I was just great riffing with you guys and just going through it and kind of seeing seeing where it all went. Um, very uh, very happy to be here. Thanks for this. Awesome. We'll do yeah. it again. Yeah, we loved having you, David. We'll have yeah. to have you back. Thank you all. Hey, thanks again for tuning in to Invisible Machines. Don't forget to follow Invisible Machines wherever you get your podcasts so that you can hear new episodes as soon as they drop. You can also watch this podcast on the Invisible Machines YouTube channel. Thank you so much to everyone who listens to this podcast and especially to those of you who leave comments because we've received a lot of really useful commentary that has helped us shape this podcast as we move forward with it. Thank you as always to our producers, Elias Parker, Kate Timchenko, and our video editor, Michael Litvinov for making this podcast look and sound wonderful. We look forward to catching up with you again next week, right here on Invisible Machines. <laughs>